The disciples were caught in a dangerous, deadly storm out on the middle of the sea, an angry sea in the middle of the darkest night. They called on Jesus and Jesus came to their rescue and he ministered these words. He said, peace, be still. And the storm calmed to a still. Jesus wants to speak into your life today. He wants to minister to you in the midst of your storm and bring peace and calmness. Let's call on the Lord right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the name of Jesus and that we can call on you and that we can speak and authorize the very peace that Jesus paid for in our lives. In the midst of the storm, in the midst of the darkest night and the trouble, we call on Jesus right now. And precious Holy Spirit, you're on assignment right here, right now to comfort us to minister to us, to reveal the word of God so that our lives will never be the same again in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Look, have you ever wondered where this world is with respect to God's timetable? You hear the news, you, you see events unfolding that you never even imagined were possible. And have you noticed, have you noticed the uncertainty? Even the most sure leaders are having the ground shake underneath of them. Thomas Jefferson, the, the American diplomat, founding father, and the third president of the United States, he said this, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. You know, God's merciful, but everyone's beliefs right now are being put to the fire, and things once thought to be certain are questioned. They're even doubted. Eschatology is the biblical study of end time theology. For thousands of years, God has been accurately pointing to the present right now. We may be shocked, but God's not shocked. And the good news, the amazing news in the midst of all this shaking is this. God's got you. He's on time. He's always, always prepared. In Luke 21, Jesus said that the end times could be compared to when a fig tree puts forth its shoot. In other words, you recognize the season by the evidence of key things showing up in that season. So where are we in this timetable? Well, you don't have to be a prophet to read the room, or in this case, read the world, right? The Bible says in the last days there will be times of difficulty. Well, we've got that. For people, they will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, without self-control, even brutal. Wow. What do you think? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Jesus said in Luke 21, verse 26, that men's hearts will fail them, listen to this, because of fear. That's happening today. Stress, anxiety, doubt, and fear, they're causing cardiac arrest. And yet throughout the gospels, Jesus tells us one thing over and over and over. He says, fear not. That's what he told the disciples when he spoke out onto the wind and the waves on the rugged sea. He said, fear not, fear not for I am with you. The most insidious plague has overtaken the world right now, and there is no natural therapeutic, no vaccine or antibiotic for it. It shows no mercy to either child or aging grandparent. It doesn't care what your skin color is, your education or your net worth. Fear is the new world order, and the evil master plan is to make you, your family, your loved ones, its slave. But God's love has other plans, better plans, unfailing plans for you and for me. Jesus has good news plans for your future, and it begins with his command, fear not. That's right. Jesus has the antidote for this epidemic, and it starts working on the inside of you immediately. Today's a day of good news, so welcome to part one of No Fear Here. We begin this series, and it's called No Fear Here. Look, this word from God is absolutely essential for you and me, especially right now at this time in history, when evil is trying to hijack your thinking, control your decisions, and coerce you into submission. 
And if you feel like you're the only one struggling with this or, or failing at this right now, put that thought out of your mind. Even Jesus' disciples had to be told over and over and over, don't be afraid. Jesus is telling them, fear not. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Jesus comes walking on the water, and what's the first thing he has to say to them? Fear not. Several years ago, when I first wrote this series, I was speaking at a men's conference and asked, who struggles with fear? Well, out of a thousand men, not one guy put up his hand. So I rephrased the question. Who struggles with worry about your health, concern for your wife and your kids, anxiety on the job, stress about the future, paying your bills? <laughs> Suddenly, 1,000 guys are all struggling with fear. We've become so familiar with the disease that we normalize it. We own it. We embrace it like it's part of our identity, part of who we are. But it's not. Fear is not you or part of your design. No, no, no. Put your hand on your heart right now and say this. Fear is not part of my God design, so I won't allow it. Say that. Say, I won't allow it. I forbid it. For some of you, just doing that is a giant leap toward freedom. Look, life is full of challenges. As we try and figure out how to be healthy, stay healthy, look better, feel better, how to get happy, how to make it in life, where to work, to live, who to marry, how to raise our kids. And kids are even thinking, well, what about my parents? Are they okay? What can I do? What should I do? Yes, life is full of major questions and huge challenges. Jesus said it like this. He said in John 16, verse 33, in the world, you will have trials, tribulations, distress, frustration, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. That's what Jesus says. Remember, the world systems thrive on coercive power of fear, of control in your life. God's word is going to teach us how to outlaw fear in our lives. Oh, that sounds good. Yes, God wants to give you the power to forbid fear to terminate all of its access to your mind, your heart, and your home. To authorize a no fear here life requires faith. Faith authorizes life and blessing. Fear, on the other hand, authorizes a garden of anxiety, worry, fear, care. Even terror grows out of the seeds of fear. You know, a few years ago, I planted a couple of evergreen trees in our backyard. I authorized them, so to speak. Two small, beautiful trees were planted. They were authorized to grow, and now they're big, they're beautiful, wonderful trees. Carrots grow because someone dares to plant a carrot seed where there are no carrots. Weeds grow because someone allows them to grow. They're permitted, passively authorized. Regardless of what you believe is holding you back or weighing you down, fear is your number one enemy, my friend. If you struggle with anger, chances are you've got a fear problem. If you struggle with lust, fear is at the root. If you struggle with jealousy or envy, it's rooted in fear. Do you struggle with addiction? Your number one problem is fear. Do you hate and criticize others in your heart? You guessed it. You've got to get the fear out of your heart. Fear is the number one seed for crazy and for dysphoria. If you allow fear, the counterfeit of faith, that's what fear is, the counterfeit of faith, you are authorizing disaster and failure in your life. Bernie Mac, you remember him, the late great comedian. He said this about dealing with fear. He said, that's the whole key to anything. Don't be afraid to fail. And Bernie Mac is not afraid to fail. What you tolerate, you can never change. What you tolerate, you will not change. God has given us the power of choice. It's a spiritual power, authority to allow or to forbid. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, God says, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And then he goes on and says, you choose which one you want. Well, why wouldn't God choose for us? Faith has decided that you must choose. It's hard to comprehend, but fear is a choice. Much like faith and courage is a choice, fear is a choice. Philippians 4 verse 6, the apostle Paul wrote to the church and he said, do not be anxious about anything but Pray about everything. 
It's a choice. Fear is enemy number one. Enemy number one. Stress, anxiety, worry, doubt, however you want to term it, that's fear and it's enemy number one. The world says, well, fear is a great motivator. What they mean is fear's the great controller, manipulator. Advertising companies use fear to sell insurance, pharmaceuticals, cars, cereal, tires, security systems, and on and on and on. Look, many businesses can't afford for you to have the antidote to fear. Why? Because fear equals profits. They make big money off of fear. They bank on you reacting to your fears. Social media regards you as the product, so they make money selling the forecast of your fears. What do you think about that? Alternately, God says love, true love, is the real power source for your life. It's what your engine burns up, it's what your engine works off of, love. So let me show you quickly and positively that your life is meant to be a no fear here zone. 1 John 4 verse 18. It says, there is no fear. How much fear? There is no fear in love. Oh, that's beautiful. But perfect love, what's it do? It casts out fear. It evicts it because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now look, if you're struggling with fear, please don't let that last part condemn your heart, make you feel like you're less. You're not. Just stay with me. Stay in this truth. God's going to really help us together. 1 John 4 verse 8, I just want to quote this part. It says, God is love. Well, we just learned that love evicts fear then we know God would never use fear on you to control you. God is not controlling or abusive. He leads us. He doesn't drive us. God has a style of leadership. It's called the shepherd style, which leads but never drives unless it's an enemy of the sheep. That's right. The shepherd does drive wolves away, but he leads his people, his sheep. Aren't you glad that it's never in God's plan for you to be afraid or to be tormented? Aren't you glad that God is the loving Father who wants you safe and also feeling safe, confident, loved, cared for, watched over, protected, directed, and at peace? Aren't you glad about that? We know God is not the author of fear because deception is at the root of fear. Let me say that again. Deception is at the root of fear. If you're going to have a no fear here life, you must root out all deception, all of it. What makes fear dangerous and such a trap to your soul is that it's rooted in lies and deceit. Lies gain access covertly to your life when you feel powerless and out of control, when you feel that like a need isn't being met. Individuals in crisis feel desperate for help. They, they feel desperate for relief. They got to have comfort, aid, and a steadying force in their life. It's not that they don't think God is powerful, but that they don't believe God loves them. If you believe a lie about yourself or you believe a lie about God, you see, you open a door to believing that you're unloved, you're forgotten, you're despised, you're powerless, you're without authority, you're even worthless. Chris Tucker once said this, you know, the famous actor and comedian, he said, your mindset is everything. It can either make you or break you. See, what you agree with, you authorize in your life. It's a tree growing in your backyard, so to speak. If you agree with God's truth, then you authorize saving, healing, power in your life. But if you agree with a lie, with deception, you give authority and control to that virus of lie and deception and dread in your life. For example, when a person deals with a death or a tragedy in life, they quickly need to believe something. They need a doctrine. That's what a doctrine is about. It's about your system of belief. Is your doctrine based on experience or is it based on God's truth? Pam's and my niece, Tawny, she struggled with fear when she was a little girl and worried terribly. She was about 12 years old and just tormented with fear. It was a time of great change and transition into adolescence. Her grandfather had just passed away, whom she was very close with. She struggled with her belief about life after death and developed this 
catastrophic fear thinking. Remember, she's 12 years old. She started having anxiety, depression, physically shaking even, insomnia. She became afraid of the dark, the fear of losing more loved ones or being left alone and death for even herself terrified her. Struggling to understand her feelings, she felt isolated. She felt alone. She started hearing the lie, I'm the only one. I'm the only one like this. Panic and anxiety attacks gripped her until she started speaking God's word at bedtime. That was the turnaround to her story that her dad encouraged her in. Tawny memorized Psalm 23 and then her dad would speak Psalm 91 over as she would go to sleep at night. Her body began to relax. She stopped all the shaking. She felt peace. She felt a calm. She began to have sweet, sweet sleep. Let's look at what Tawny meditated on to evict the fear, the anxiety, the lies of catastrophic thinking out of her mind. Look at what this little girl authorized to put up the no fear here sign in her mind and her thinking. Psalm 23, one through six. She would say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a no fear here psalm. And now look at Tawny right here in this picture. She's a grown woman with a husband and kids, and she's living the no fear here life. She lives fearlessly. She takes steps of faith, leaps of faith even, to do her job and everything that her and her husband are on an adventure in. She lives that fearless life, and you can too. Franklin D. Roosevelt, the 32nd president of the United States during the Great Depression said this, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. So is there such a thing as a healthy fear? You've probably heard this before. Well, you know, everyone needs a little bit of a healthy fear. Well, here's the problem with that. You cannot remove something that you tolerate or believe is good or profitable. You can't deal with it. You can't remove it. There is no such thing as a healthy fear. That's an oxymoron, a contradiction of terms. That's like saying the wise fool was a devout atheist after a good bear attack. <laughs> I don't think so right? Don't think too hard on that. Or how about this? Well, the other day, little Johnny got hit by a car after I told him not to play on the highway, and I'm sure he learned a good lesson from all of this. What? Are you kidding me? That's nuts. But that's the senselessness of trying to create a virtue out of fear. That's like trying to sanction sin. It truly is the foolishness of our culture thinking that if you legalize it, it's therefore moral. Not true. That's just stupid, the Bible says. Proverbs 12, verse 1. Whoever hates correction, the Bible says, is stupid. God corrects us by getting fear out of us, not into us. That's right. No fear here. People tend to use fear as a tool to control and pressure others. It's the whole, the end justifies the means thing. Well, it's because I love you. No, no. Warnings are good, but fear is harmful. It's poison. Fear contaminates a person's heart and mind with toxicity. Attention all parents. You can and should mentor with a no fear here doctrine belief system. For example, you want your child not to be afraid, but to have a healthy sense of boundaries. Boundaries are good. So, for example, the campfire is fun and you can enjoy toasting your marshmallows, but respect the fire, right? How about this one? The family car is a great blessing, but respect and be alert around the vehicle, its weight, its power, its size, 
right? You can guard and protect what's precious with principle, not with paranoia, anxiety, and fear. Prudence and preparation, yes. Worry and anxiety, no, never. Why? This is important to ask because I've seen families justify the use of fear for protection. They want to protect their family, their kids, their, their, the members of the house. Remember, deception is at the root of all fear. Fear, therefore, contradicts the truth. It contradicts your design. Remember Adam and Eve, the first humans on planet Earth from the very beginning. Adam and Eve were in paradise until they were deceived. Afterward, when they heard God in the garden, they hid themselves because they were afraid. Fear was the immediate result out of the root of deception. Deception gave birth to fear. 1 John 4 verse 18, it says this, there is no fear in love. Always remember that. There's no fear in love. We know God is love and his word is truth. Therefore, there is no fear in truth. So why in the world do people constantly attribute tragic acts of destruction to God, who is love? It's like reporting that perfect love inflicted a massive earthquake on a city, killing many. It was an act of God. What? That's just crazy. No. That's just pure ignorance of God's good character, his faithful word, his loving kindness, his unfailing mercy. God is good, kind, and awesome, always. In 1749, a fellow by the name of Benjamin Franklin, you know that name, he invented this amazing thing called a lightning rod, which would be mounted on the top of a building and redirect extremely dangerous levels of electricity from a lightning strike safely to the ground. Well, in the city of Boston, Franklin's lightning rod was seen by some pastors and clergy as interfering with God's divine wrath upon intended sinners because his lightning rod diverted destruction away from buildings and property. Can I just say, this is so sad. It's just nuts. Many church leaders refused to put the lightning rod on their church buildings, so in an ironic twist of fate, the lightning bolts would seem to skip bars, pubs, gambling dens, and places known for prostitution, and instead burn the unprotected church buildings to the ground. Understand this. Ignorance and fear burn those buildings down, not God. God's a protector, a shield, a shelter from the storm. Look at what Jesus says here in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. Burn down. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. We should all see the beauty around us and say, now that's an act of God, right? The beautiful things, that's an act of God. God's word is a no fear here word of life for you today. Having faith in God is like spiritually putting a lightning rod up over your life, except it's way more modern, high tech, and advanced. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God's not the destroyer, my friend. Yes, he does the work of destroying your enemy, 1 John 3.8 says, but if you're struggling with fear and anxiety, worry or fretting, you can be sure that a lie or deception is at the root. Why? Because God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's a great father who instructs us in faith with love, not fear, anxiety, and terror. I have to say it again. God does not terrorize his family to produce results. That's abuse. And God is not an abuser. Fear is never from God. God doesn't release wolves and bears in a room with lambs to teach them a lesson. That's a lie the devil spawns so that he can hatch distrust in the good shepherd. Be assured, it's defamation and character assassination. What kind of good shepherd would God be if he didn't provide and care for his sheep perfectly? Make no mistake, God, the good shepherd, never fails. And God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He wants you fearless and full of faith. God has good plans for your future, plans to do you good and not harm you. Now that's the truth. And all of it's activated in your life with faith in Him, not fear and torment. 
Are you struggling with fear today? Maybe it's anxiety, worry, or just this thought in the back of your mind that makes it hard to fall asleep at night. First of all, don't feel condemned or believe the lie that God is allowing this torment to beat up on you. He wants you free. Free to live life strong and not be under the influence of dread or worry, the pain of anxiousness. Jesus came to destroy the power, the authority of fear out of your life. Yes, you can live fear free, but you must authorize it. Just like I authorize those nice trees to grow in my backyard, you need God's perfect love authorized in the ground of your heart today. How? With your faith, that legal profession from your mouth representing your faith. You get to invite Jesus to be Lord of your life. Here's the amazing thing. Only you can do this. Only you can give God access to the ground of your heart. God won't force his way. He's not a tyrant or a dictator. He is the loving Heavenly Father. Oh, Pastor Stephen, I, I've asked Jesus into my life years ago. You know, I've prayed before, but are you still afraid? Like I've said, don't feel condemned, but get encouraged. If you're still afraid, it means that you still have more room in your heart available for love to come on the inside. Think of it this way. You have more room to hold more love. That's a great thing to know. If you believe on Jesus as the source of God's love, why don't you pray this after me? Dear Lord Jesus, I give you all of my heart. Fill every room of my life with your love, your truth. Right now, I surrender. I've blamed God for things. I've either brought on myself or they were strategies of the enemy. I say no to fear. I say no to the enemy's lies. I'm done tolerating deceit. Jesus, you died on the cross for me, rose up from the grave. You're my king, my Lord, my savior. Now I'm born again. I'm born to win. No fear here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.